Chapter Twelve of Tarzan of the Apes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Tarzan of the Apes by Edgar Rice Burroughs, Chapter Twelve: Man's Reason. There was one of the tribe of Tarzan who questioned his authority, and that was Turkaz, the son of Tublat. But he so feared the keen knife and the deadly arrows of his new lord that he confined the manifestation of his objections to petty disobediences and irritating mannerisms. Tarzan knew, however, that he but waited his opportunity to wrest the kingship from him by some sudden stroke of treachery, and so he was ever on his guard against surprise. For months the life of the little band went on much as it had before, except that Tarzan's greater intelligence and his ability as a hunter were the means of providing for them more bountifully than ever before. Most of them, therefore, were more than content with the change in rulers. Tarzan led them by night to the fields of the black men, and there, warned by their chief's superior wisdom, they ate only what they required, nor ever did they destroy what they could not eat as is the way of Manu, the monkey, and of most apes. So, while the blacks were wroth at the continued pilfering of their fields, they were not discouraged in their efforts to cultivate the land, as would have been the case had Tarzan permitted his people to lay waste the plantation wantonly. During this period Tarzan paid many nocturnal visits to the village, where he often renewed his supply of arrows. He soon noticed the food always standing at the foot of the tree which was his avenue into the palisade, and after a little he commenced to eat whatever the blacks put there. When the awestruck savages saw that the food disappeared overnight they were filled with consternation and dread, for it was one thing to put food out to propitiate a god or a devil, but quite another thing to have this spirit really come into the village and eat it. Such a thing was unheard of, and it clouded their superstitious minds with all manner of vague fears. Nor was this all. The periodic disappearance of their arrows, and the strange pranks perpetrated by unseen hands, had wrought them to such a state that life had become a veritable burden in their new home, and now it was that Mabonga and his headmen began to talk of abandoning the village and seeking a site farther on in the jungle. Presently the black warriors began to strike farther and farther south into the heart of the forest, when they went to hunt, looking for a site for a new village. More often was the tribe of Tarzan disturbed by these wandering huntsmen. Now was the quiet, fierce solitude of the primeval forest broken by new strange cries. No longer was there safety for bird or beast. Man had come. Other animals passed up and down the jungle by day and by night, fierce, cruel beasts, but their weaker neighbors only fled from their immediate vicinity to return again when the danger was past. With man it is different. When he comes many of the larger animals instinctively leave the district entirely, seldom if ever to return, and thus it has always been with the great anthropoids. They flee man as man flees a pestilence. For a short time, the tribe of Tarzan lingered in the vicinity of the beach because their new chief hated the thought of leaving the treasured contents of the little cabin forever. But when one day a member of the tribe discovered the blacks in great numbers on the banks of a little stream that had been their watering place for generations, and in the act of clearing a space in the jungle and erecting many huts, the apes would remain no longer, and so Tarzan led them inland for many marches to a spot as yet undefiled by the foot of a human being. Once every moon Tarzan would go swinging rapidly back through the swaying branches to have a day with his books, and to replenish his supply of arrows. This latter task was becoming more and more difficult, for the blacks had taken to hiding their supply away at night in granaries and living huts. This necessitated watching by day on Tarzan's part to discover where the arrows were being concealed. Twice had he entered huts at night while the inmates lay sleeping upon their mats, and stolen the arrows from the very sides of the warriors. But this method he realized to be too fraught with danger, 
and so he commenced picking up solitary hunters with his long, deadly noose, stripping them of weapons and ornaments, and dropping their bodies from a high tree into the village street during the still watches of the night. These various escapades again so terrorized the blacks that, had it not been for the monthly respite between Tarzan's visits, in which they had opportunity to renew hope that each fresh incursion would prove the last, they soon would have abandoned their new village. The blacks had not as yet come upon Tarzan's cabin on the distant beach, but the ape-man lived in constant dread that, while he was away with the tribe, they would discover and despoil his treasure. So it came that he spent more and more time in the vicinity of his father's last home, and less and less with the tribe. Presently the members of his little community began to suffer on account of his neglect, for disputes and quarrels constantly arose which only the king might settle peaceably. At last some of the older apes spoke to Tarzan on the subject, and for a month thereafter he remained constantly with the tribe. The duties of kingship among the anthropoids are not many or arduous. In the afternoon comes Thaka, possibly, to complain that old Mungo has stolen his new wife. Then must Tarzan summon all before him, and if he finds that the wife prefers her new lord, he commands that matters remain as they are, or possibly that Mungo give Thaka one of his daughters in exchange. Whatever his decision, the apes accept it as final, and return to their occupations satisfied. Then comes Tana, shrieking and holding tight her side from which blood is streaming. Gunto, her husband, has cruelly bitten her, and Gunto, summoned, says that Tana is lazy and will not bring him nuts and beetles, or scratch his back for him. So Tarzan scolds them both and threatens Gunto with a taste of the death-bearing slivers if he abuses Tana further, and Tana, for her part, is compelled to promise better attention to her wifely duties. And so it goes, little family differences for the most part, which, if left unsettled, would result finally in greater factional strife, and the eventual dismemberment of the tribe. But Tarzan tired of it, as he found the kingship meant the curtailment of his liberty. He longed for the little cabin and the sun-kissed sea, for the cool interior of the well-built house, and for the never-ending wonders of the many books. As he had grown older he found that he had grown away from his people. Their interests and his were far removed. They had not kept pace with him, nor could they understand aught of the many strange and wonderful dreams that passed through the active brain of their human king. So limited was their vocabulary that Tarzan could not even talk with them of the many new truths, and the great fields of thought that his reading had opened up before his longing eyes, or make known ambitions which stirred his soul. Among the tribe he no longer had friends as of old. A little child may find companionship in many strange and simple creatures, but to a grown man there must be some semblance of equality in intellect as the basis for agreeable association. Had Kayla lived, Tarzan would have sacrificed all else to remain near her, but now that she was dead, and the playful friends of his childhood grown into fierce and surly brutes, he felt that he much preferred the peace and solitude of his cabin to the irksome duties of leadership amongst a horde of wild beasts. The hatred and jealousy of Turkaz, son of Tublat, did much to counteract the effect of Tarzan's desire to renounce his kingship among the apes, for, stubborn young Englishman that he was, he could not bring himself to retreat in the face of so malignant an enemy. That Terkoz would be chosen leader in his stead he knew full well, for time and again the ferocious brute had established his claim to physical supremacy over the few bull-apes who had dared resent his savage bullying. Tarzan would have liked to subdue the ugly beast without recourse to knife or arrows. So much had his great strength and agility increased in the period following his maturity, that he had come to believe that he might master the redoubtable Turcos in a hand-to-hand -hand fight, were it not for the terrible advantage the anthropoid's huge fighting fangs gave him over the poorly armed Tarzan. 
The entire matter was taken out of Tarzan's hands one day by force of circumstances, and his future left open to him so that he might go or stay without any stain upon his savage escutcheon. It happened thus. The tribe was feeding quietly, spread over a considerable area, when a great screaming arose some distance east of where Tarzan lay upon his belly, beside a limpid brook, attempting to catch an elusive fish in his quick brown hands. With one accord the tribe swung rapidly toward the frightened cries, and there found Terkoz holding an old female by the hair, and beating her unmercifully with his great hands. As Tarzan approached he raised his hand aloft for Terkoz to desist, for the female was not his, but belonged to a poor old ape whose fighting days were long over, and who therefore could not protect his family. Terkoz knew that it was against the laws of his kind to strike this woman of another, but, being a bully, he had taken advantage of the weakness of the female's husband to chastise her because she had refused to give up to him a tender young rodent she had captured. When Terkoz saw Tarzan approaching without his arrows, he continued to belabor the poor woman in a studied effort to affront his hated chieftain. Tarzan did not repeat his warning signal but instead rushed bodily upon the waiting Terkoz. Never had the ape-man fought so terrible a battle since that long-gone day when Bolgani, the great king gorilla, had so horribly manhandled him ere the new-found knife had, by accident, pricked the savage heart. Tarzan's knife on the present occasion but barely offset the gleaming fangs of Terkoz, and what little advantage the ape had over the man in brute strength was almost balanced by the latter's wonderful quickness and agility. In the sum total of their points, however, the anthropoid had a shade the better of the battle, and had there been no other personal attribute to influence the final outcome, Tarzan of the Apes, the young Lord Greystoke, would have died as he had lived, an unknown savage beast in equatorial Africa. But there was that which had raised him far above his fellows of the jungle that little spark which spells the whole vast difference between man and brute, reason. This it was which saved him from death beneath the iron muscles and tearing fangs of Terkoz. Scarcely had they fought a dozen seconds ere they were rolling upon the ground, striking, tearing, and rending, two great savage beasts battling to the death. Terkoz had a dozen knife wounds on head and breast, and Tarzan was torn and bleeding, his scalp in one place half torn from his head, so that a great piece hung down over one eye, obstructing his vision. But so far the young Englishman had been able to keep those horrible fangs from his jugular, and now, as they fought less fiercely for a moment, to regain their breath, Tarzan formed a cunning plan. He would work his way to the other's back, and, clinging there with tooth and nail, drive his knife home until Turcoz was no more. The maneuver was accomplished more easily than he had hoped, for the stupid beast, not knowing what Tarzan was attempting, made no particular effort to prevent the accomplishment of the design. But when finally he realized that his antagonist was fastened to him where his teeth and fists alike were useless against him, Tukaz hurled himself about upon the ground so violently that Tarzan could but cling desperately to the leaping, turning, twisting body and ere he had struck a blow the knife was hurled from his hand by a heavy impact against the earth, and Tarzan found himself defenseless. During the rollings and squirmings of the next few minutes, Tarzan's hold was loosened a dozen times, until finally an accidental circumstance of those swift and ever-changing evolutions gave him a new hold with his right hand, which he realized was absolutely unassailable. His arm was passed beneath Turkoz's arm from behind, and his hand and forearm encircled the back of Turkoz's neck. It was the half-Nelson of modern wrestling which the untaught ape-man had stumbled upon, but superior reason showed him in an instant the value of the thing he had discovered. It was the difference to him between life and death. And so he struggled to encompass a similar hold with the left hand, and in a few moments Terkoz's bull neck was creaking beneath a full Nelson. There was no more lunging about now. The two lay perfectly still upon the ground, Tarzan upon Terkoz's back. 
slowly the bullet head of the ape was being forced lower and lower upon his chest. Tarzan knew what the result would be. In an instant the neck would break. Then there came to Tokoza's rescue the same thing that had put him in these sore straits, a man's reasoning power. If I kill him, thought Tarzan, what advantage will it be to me? Will it not rob the tribe of a great fighter? And if Turkoz be dead, he will know nothing of my supremacy. While alive, he will ever be an example to the other apes. Kagoda, hissed Tarzan in Turkoz's ear, which in ape tongue means freely translated, do you surrender? For a moment there was no reply, and Tarzan added a few more ounces of pressure, which elicited a horrified shriek of pain from the great beast. Kagoda, repeated Tarzan. Kagoda, cried Turkos. Listen, said Tarzan, easing up a trifle, but not releasing his hold. I am Tarzan, king of the apes, mighty hunter, mighty fighter. In all the jungle there is none so great. You have said Kagoda to me. All the tribe have heard. Quarrel no more with your king or your people, for next time I shall kill you. Do you understand? Huh, assented Turkos. And are you satisfied? Huh, said the ape. Tarzan led him up, and in a few minutes all were back at their vocations, as though naught had occurred to mar the tranquillity of their primeval forest haunts. But deep in the minds of the apes was rooted the conviction that Tarzan was a mighty fighter, and a strange creature. Strange because he had had it in his power to kill his enemy, but had allowed him to live unharmed. That afternoon as the tribe came together, as was their wont before darkness settled on the jungle, Tarzan, his wounds washed in the waters of the stream, called the old males about him. "'You have seen again today that Tarzan of the apes is the greatest among you,' he said. "'Huh,' they replied with one voice, "'Tarzan is great.' Tarzan, he continued, is not an ape. He is not like his people. His ways are not their ways. And so Tarzan is going back to the lair of his own kind, by the waters of the great lake which has no farther shore. You must choose another to rule you, for Tarzan will not return. And thus young Lord Greystoke took the first step toward the goal which he had set, the finding of other white men like himself. End of chapter.